with your feet on the floor. Time to make your way into the city. Forecast for today, partly sunny, 6% chance of just about anything in the traffic. Well, you know the story there. The T reports no major delays. And you know, I have to vouch for that. I took the train myself this morning. I was on the red line, looked up from my newspaper, and artwork. I thought I was Emerald City. I thought it was wild, and I wasn't the only one. I take a second while I'm rushing to a train to look at it and appreciate it, and uh, I'm glad it's there. I love Alewife Station. It's just a wonderful place to pass through. I think it's great. I think they should do this on the Green Line, too. In 1977, the Secretary of Transportation initiated a policy whereby federal funds could be spent on art and transportation settings. At the same time, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority was about to build or begin construction on its Red Line Northwest Extension, which would include new stations for Harvard, Porter, Davis, and Alewife. It was in 1897 that Boston built the nation's first underground transit system. A century later, Boston has come to the forefront again, this time in bringing contemporary art into its subways. The very original stations that were done in station modernization some years ago were incorporating the photo mural as a piece of art. And we were very scared at the time to talk about art per se, because uh, people would say, well, you know, why are you spending all such money on art? In fact, what the public questioned was money being spent on highways as a solution to urban transportation problems. In what was to become a crowning victory for neighborhood and environmental defenders, legislation was created in the 1970s enabling the transfer of federal highway funds to mass transportation. The 3.2 mile addition to the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority's red line reaches from Harvard Square through Somerville into North Cambridge. The $578 million construction budget included monies for four new stations. The MBTA committed one half of 1% of that budget to public art. Together, the Cambridge Arts Council and the MBTA wrote a grant to the federal government and received a grant to develop guidelines and a process by which art could be implemented into the subway stations. We became uh, the pilot project for art and transit in this country with that initial grant. Putting art into subways is no small matter. I mean, these environments are very, very difficult. You don't have white walls. You don't have clean, pristine spaces like you do in museums or galleries. It was going to be, you know, quite an endeavor for artists. Artists are not used to collaborating with architects and working in spaces such as subways. On one hand, we were very excited, the idea of introducing art into our station and to help make the environment more interesting and more lively. But we were also concerned uh, whether we would find artists that understood collaboration and understood the problems of, uh, of working with the transit authority and working with public groups and, and community groups. It was something of a struggle with the architects who had not envisioned that wall with art on it. It's a sort of sculptural wall, and they designed it to be sort of a piece of sculpture, I think. And they wanted my artwork to be on one of the other walls. They were trying to convince me that this was not a good site for the artwork because it curved up and around and that people wouldn't be able to get close enough to it or see it. But I had a vision for how the piece would be seen and um, I felt that that was the wall for it, for what I wanted, wanted to do. And I think they felt that it wouldn't work with the architecture, that it was too busy, too many different colors. I mean, their, their aesthetic is more of a high-tech aesthetic. And at one point, they tried to uh, convince me to make the piece largely beige, like the wall around it. Um, and it was just a very, it was just a, a kind of a difficult uh, uh, struggle. It's not only architects, it's uh, art juries, too. Um, or maybe artists themselves see a nice big wall, see something that, um, 
that uh, needs a little spiffing up, and they, they generally say, well, this is where the art should go. That's not the role of the artist. They shouldn't be the uh, kind of embellishing a space in that way. They should be creating another situation which is much more um, experiential. Particularly um, in spaces that are often used, it should be put where the people really are. No, man, I got a better right here. No, watch it, watch it. Hey, lady, you dropped the glove. Well, to my mind, the most successful piece is Mags Harry's Glove Cycle. She thought of the fact that a subway station is a place where you're on the move, where you're traveling. That element of time suggested narrative to her, a narrative that was flexible enough that people could interpret differently, but to which everyone could relate because it was dealt with on a very human scale. And she used the hand or the glove as the symbol of the hand as something that was tactile, touchable, what we really need is an art that reveals itself slowly over time, that has a kind of subtlety to it that uh, cannot be read all at once as a, as a Calder single unit uh, can, and therefore uh, is likely to be smaller scale, something that can be approached, touched if necessary, uh, and then seen from greater or smaller distances. The pieces selected for the Arts on the Line program represent a broad range and eclectic appreciation of the current state of public art. The works include functional designs, monuments, and various pieces exploring the experiences of changing light and movement. There were many approaches to the ways in which art might contribute to the enrichment of local culture and people's daily lives. Well, when I do public art, I, I try to bring into the piece kind of history of the area, history of the, of the city. So in Boston, I started actually in the graveyard, looking at old New England gravestones, which have a very particular kind of imagery. And uh, that became the very beginning and the very end of the piece. So I chose the decorative arts as the content of the piece because the decorative arts are sort of the, the carrier of popular culture. And the decorative arts are full of kind of uh, imagination and playfulness. And they don't put people off, they don't intimidate people. And uh, people, because people don't think of them as art. Yeah, the piece is a cycle. It's completed because it's only half finished when the train comes in, and then suddenly when the train leaves, the people are gone, it's lonely. It waits for passengers. All right, when you calm down, you're gonna give yourself an ulcer. Every day it's the same thing. I hate my job, I hate my job. Oh, yeah, because you have the best job I've ever heard of. Your boss is great. No, I like, I like my job, it's true. I take it home, I would do anything, but it took me six years well, to wait get that job. Okay. I get the red wand tickets for my boss the other day. Oh, he doesn't God. go to the exhibit. He goes to the coffee shop, he goes home. I know. I can't take it. Well, look, I, I, it wasn't considerate, and I would have been mad too. This, this is what I feel like, a mess. That's what I feel like. No, no, this is art. You're crazy, Cal, and a kid can throw colors I and shapes. I see it every day, and I really like it. It's got form, it's got color, it moves, we go up the escalator, it comes up with us. I mean, it's really lovely. I really like it. I like the yellow. Yeah, the yellow's nice, too. Uh, did you know that it spells Davis? Come on. No, it really does. There's a D. I see the D. A, the I mean, it, it, it does have letters in it. And you can find the rest of the letters just for interest. And that's that factor of actually trying to get persons to enter the piece. I've thought about this. I mean, I've thought about and negated sort of aesthetic concerns in order to make that piece actually work. 
So rather than making it a serious problem, I decided to have fun. And I think that literally in the working of the projects that I started to draw, and I drew for almost a year and a half before I completed the model, I became almost an entertainer. I think that in the sense is that I placed myself literally in the other person's position and said, what would really move them? I think that I've done this before and that I enacted what would be their emotions upon seeing a piece or actually seeing a work of mine. I did not want to lose in a way that persons or the public would actually see it. So that I went to, to highway structure for signs. It is a piece of signage. It's a bus stop sign. That's all it is. Stand right here. One approach in public art has been to integrate an artist's sense of beauty and thought into fixtures that serve a functional purpose. The bollards at Porter Square, designed as protection for pedestrians, have been decorated with sandblasted insignias representing the various cultures which form the surrounding neighborhoods. At Alewife Station, William Kaiser has created sculptural benches in the passenger pickup and drop-off areas. Obviously, durability is, is the first thing any public artist has to think about. But uh, that sort of physical limitation has never bothered artists in the past. Uh, that's one thing that they're good at, is, is surmounting that kind of technical challenge. So the best of them use it to their advantage. The artists were not the only ones faced with difficult construction problems. The builders had to reconstruct Harvard Station while subway service continued below ground. The 10-year construction effort included innovative engineering techniques, three new subway stations, and a platform 120 feet below ground. They had to bore through bedrock deep below densely populated neighborhoods, accommodate an inquisitive and sometimes irate public. And they had to work with artists. I was favorably impressed with the artist's talent. I think the reasons that they were so talented in artists, they uh, were the very reasons that they showed a uh, unbelievable naivete uh, regarding business, schedules, costs. Being a general contractor, we really uh, didn't give the artwork much consideration at the very beginning of the project. Our main concerns was getting the project going, uh, maintaining our schedule. The contractors, to my knowledge, none of them had ever been involved with artists. So when they saw us coming, they were very concerned. You know, we were asking for special considerations, and special consideration to them meant trouble. They, again, feel we are prima donnas. We come in with uh, little projects, and uh, we demand a lot from them. Um, there's not much sympathy from the builders. Um, and sometimes the hostility is hard to take. I think some of the artists felt that they were being put upon because their artistic talents were being either questioned by a contractor who said, I don't give a damn about your, your piece. Uh, I got to have it in uh, and such and such a date. And if I don't, I'm going to continue going on. I had 20 artists with a uh, million and a half dollars, which although is a lot of art money, is relatively meager amount when we considered that we were spending uh, $578 million worth of construction work. And uh, we spent a lot more time on that million and a half dollars, dollar for dollar, than we did on the construction work by a factor of maybe a hundred. learn to appreciate the artwork, what goes into it, what the artist is trying to convey to uh, the people that are going to view his artwork. And I think it does have a place in society, in all construction, even new and old. Uh, I just think it brings out uh, so much more of the uh, construction that we're doing. You see a lot more respect for the stations because it is so clean. Art being a clean thing will make the subway stations be more respected. So I think it is a good idea to put art in the subway stations. 
look right here. This one goes down this way, open up saying, hey, here's Boston. This way goes, boom, all these different ideas and colors on this one over here. This is Harvard, all these different ideas and colors. It's got a lot of theme to it, it really does. And I don't think anything of it. Can't see any uh, sense in it. They should have placed the John Harvard statue there. This is Harvard Square. Yeah, why not? Sure, it's fine. I, I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but I kind of like it. It seems to fit in. It's got the right colors. Looks very sort of Harvard Square-ish, but uh, yeah, I like it. I think it lightens the subway. It has a tendency to cause people to be a little more relaxed and look at the easier things of riding in the subway trains and to get along with the heterogeneous conglomeration of idiosyncrasies that you run across in the subway station, including myself. To select the art, individual art committees were formed for each station. The process of selecting the artists assured the involvement of the chosen artists from the earliest stages of design and a level of community participation. At Davis Square, two artists worked with local school children in creating a dazzling tile mural. I was surprised to see it down there, but happy that, I'm, that it was mine was chosen to be down there on the wall. I didn't really think my tile was going to be down there, though. I didn't think it was that good. Well, when we were in school during Art One Day, they asked us to make a picture on a piece of paper because they were going to make it into a tile and put it in the tea station. Well, it was about six when I made my tile called My Family. That's an expression of feeling. People just draw what they feel, what they feel like. This is a fisherman and his wife that's been here for many, many years. Was the nice, they were the nicest people that you ever met in your whole life. If you didn't have a dime, you still could get a nice dinner for nothing. <laughs> well, they had a restaurant? Oh, yeah, a little restaurant. You know, dear, this new park is filled with memories. I know, Bill. I always see Mrs. Kinney here looking while almost searching. You mean, what was his name? John Kenny, who was killed in Vietnam? I'll never forget that boy. The question of whether public art should be temporary or permanent is actually the essential question of public art. But I think that the sense of permanent art does isolate uh, temporary works, it means that there's a lot missing, and it means that the audience is missing who is actually the client that you're literally working for. They might have temporary situations that might please them more than something that is dull and boring. Moments which are minutes or seconds are just as important, perhaps, as, as hundreds of years. You just have to expect, if public art is, is permanent, that there'll be great long stretches where people don't relate to it at all, and maybe it's best that it be taken down. I think it, it's best to have also a balance of both things, both, both permanence and impermanence. With an impermanent situation, you can have a lot more fun. Who should choose public art? Given that this is a representative form of government, everything we do, we have someone else make our decisions for us, more or less, people that are qualified. I think it's the same when you're spending public monies on public art. Uh, you go and you find the most qualified people to make those aesthetic decisions. People who know what's going on in the art world, people who know how artists work and what they can contribute to the culture. 
I've got more and more believing that one person should choose with the advice of many people. Um, I think oftentimes when many people are in a meeting choosing the art, um, the strongest stuff gets filtered away um, because it's a little too controversial. And I, I think public art should be controversial. I think it was a mistake that the final decision was entirely in the hands of the, of the three art experts um, uh, working on each station. Um, as people who are heavily involved in the art world, they bring to the, to the selection a lot of prejudices and biases that, that don't work well in, a, in dealing with public art. No matter how, how much you try consciously to, to um, overcome those, they still operate. And I think that the shortcomings of a lot of pieces I see in the, in the Red Line stations are that um, they smack too much of the art world and aren't accessible enough to the people who use the stations. One of the recent movements in contemporary art is called landscape art. Richard Fleischner's environmental site work integrated an emergency access road and a water drainage basin into the design of a three-acre active environment. There were concerns about the budget on the Red Line Construction Project, and uh, there was concern about the public acceptance of art being installed in the MBTA stations. The uh, money that was invested in those stations will be returned tenfold in terms of the commitment and the pride that people have, the neighborhood people have, in those stations. Well, I think the tile work as you come down uh, in the main part of the Har of Harvard Square Station is pretty impressive. That's my single favorite. Does it make you think of anything? makes me think of more art in public places. I come from Austria, and we don't have art in the subway, so it's very unusual, but I like it. I like um, Porter Square, the art there. I like that very much, the gaffs. I remember the first time I was down on the platform waiting, as always, for the tea, and I looked down at my feet, and there was this poem, just cut into the brick. Remembering my mother's face. The face is a jug of water drawn from a well. Smooth, soft, the eyes arched handles. I look and look hard to hold her. She smiles. Mm, how I am that smile, and the water spills. When the vogue for public art came into play in the 1960s, there's no question that public art was seen as a monumental piece of artwork which somehow served as an intermediary in scale between human beings and very large-scale architecture. So what finally that became, though, was a cliché formula. Okay, we'll put a sculpture of a certain size and dimension in front of a building, and ultimately it became uh, invisible, as just as the 19th century men on the horse uh, became. But it is work that really will endure. It's work that is very much appreciated by the neighborhood people and people who use the facility. And I think it has signaled to a lot of people, not only in the Boston area who use the MBTA day in and day out, but throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, throughout the country, that the MBTA has done something special. And I think that's a very nice message for us to have communicated. Well, I think it's very unique, actually. I think that, you know, the average, like, Check this young, out. young kids do graffiti, right? Check this out. One I think folder, this, check it out. One fold right, of trouble. Can y'all record this now? Can right. record this? All one right. fold of trouble. <coughs> Two, it's always good. Rock and party people in the neighborhood. While well, I'm the death defying rocker and I'm always the tip. I go by the name of MC Slick. Guaranteed to rock a party in stereo with the mellow MC and his name is Joe. 
Said we come here from mile to mile to see the raw port is like a beautiful smile. And come on the train, I get like pain. I tell you once more, it's going insane. You see, the sculptures are on the left, and I can tell you that the neek is is the best. The sculptures here, the sculptures there, and everybody know that we're rapping everywhere. So my young man here got the microphone. I tell you once more, I should just stay at home. I'm better than I like to get my car. It will take me like that. Far because the train's on. I like this station, and everybody know where short shock to station. White MCs don't even try. You bit my lines, and that is no damn lie. I said you're biting, but right, it, then you always be excited. The white MCs don't even wanna fight it. Thank you.